episode 17 of Math 1050 College Algebra. I'm Dennis Allison and I teach mathematics here at Utah Valley State College. Um, if you remember in the previous episode, we were talking about exponential functions, uh, that is functions of the form uh, f of x equals a to the x, where a is a constant uh, bigger than zero. And we looked at a special function, uh, e to the x, where uh, e is, uh, is, has a very specific value. Um, let's see, who can, who can remind us what is the value of e approximately? 2.718. 2.718. And uh, you know, if you needed to know e to a further, to a longer decimal expansion, you could find it on your calculator. But let me just tell you what the first few digits are. It's not that difficult to remember. Uh, if you expand e further, it's 2.7, and then it's 1828, 1828. Uh, whoops, 1828. Um, and then 459045. I don't know why you would need to know this number out that far, but uh, the hard part is to remember the 2.7. After that, <coughs> we have the number 1828 twice. That's the year Andrew Jackson was elected president. And then 459045, you can remember that by an isosceles right triangle where the angles are 45 degrees, uh, 90, and 45 degrees. So uh, you, now you know e to, uh, to, 16, to 16 significant digits. Um, and the graph of e to the x, <coughs> while, we're, while we're looking at this here, the graph of e to the x, which we'll, we're going to be using today, looks like this. Uh, the graph of e to the x has three target points. And uh, what we do is um, we start off from the origin, we go up one. And if I go one to the right from the origin, I go up E, or 2.7, roughly. And if I go to the left one unit, I go up one over E. And you remember how much one over E is, approximately? <coughs> one over E, if you calculate it on your calculator, it's about 0.36, or roughly a third. So you go up about a third. And then this is the graph of the function uh, e to the x, f of x equals e to the x. And this function is called the natural exponential function. And sometimes you see it abbreviated as exp of x, the so-called natural exponential function. Uh, well, let's look at the list of objectives for today's class. Uh, we want to look at uh, several applications of uh, exponential functions, and these are all involved with uh, compound interest. Now, we want to talk about uh, compounding over n periods per year, like per month or per day or per quarter. And then we also want to look at something called continuous compounding, where uh, interest is being added in a continuous fashion into the account. We'll also look at population growth, which is sort of a variation of the continuous compounding. And then finally, in today's lesson, we're going to look at an introduction to logarithms, and the, the ideas for logarithms continue into the next episode. OK, well, let's begin with compound interest. <coughs> um, you know, if you have uh, a certain amount of money that you put into an account, that's referred to as the principal. So I'm going to let P represent the principal in a, in a banking account. And let's say R represents the uh, rate of interest. Uh, that would be the annual rate of interest. And uh, then <clears throat> if I were to put a principal of P dollars into an account that pays R, uh, 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 has a percentage rate of R, then the interest that I would earn in a year would be R times P. So for example, class, if you were to put $100 in a bank account that paid 5% interest and uh, the interest was put in at the end of the year, how much money would be in your account at the end of the year? $100, 5% interest. $105? $105, exactly. You see, what you do <coughs> is you take the amount of principal that you started with, and you add on the interest that's added to that account, and that would be the principal plus uh, R times the principal, which is P times 1 plus R. OK, now, with that idea, <coughs> Let me derive a few formulas that we want to use uh, to talk about uh, compounding interest. Um, suppose that um, A at T represents the amount in the account after, um, let's say, T years. 
Okay, so if I say A at zero, <clears throat> that would be the amount in the account initially before you have any compounding that takes place. So A evaluated at zero would just be P, whatever the principal is that you put in the account. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, now after one year, after one year, I'll call that A at one, the amount in the account would be P plus uh, RP, RP being the interest that's added to the account, and that would be P times one plus R. Okay, so if the interest is added at the end of the year, then you would have P times one plus R dollars in the account. After two years, well, let's see, at the beginning of that second year, you would, you would begin with the amount that you carried over, P times one plus R, plus you would earn interest on that at a rate of R, P times one plus R. So this is your interest rate, and this is the, the new principle that you're collecting interest on. And if I factor out a common factor there, let's see, I could factor out a P and one plus R. And if I factor that out, let's see, if I factor that out, there'd be a one left over here, and there would be an R left over there. So I have one plus R twice, so I'll write this as P times one plus R squared. <coughs> Uh, at the end of three years, how much money would be in the account? Well, I would begin the third year <clears throat> with this amount of money, P times one plus R carried over from the previous year, plus I would get an interest rate of R times that, P times one plus R to the second power. So if I factor out the common factor, just like I did before, this will be P <coughs> times one plus R squared. And when I factor that out, there'll be a one left over here, and there'll be an R left over there. And this reduces to be one plus R to the third power. Now, uh, I think you can see then that as a general rule, if I were to leave money in this account for, let's say, T years rather than zero, one, two, or three, uh, you notice there's a pattern in these answers. P, P times one plus R, P times one plus R squared, P times one plus R cubed. And you notice that power is the same as the number of years. So after t years, this would be p times one plus r to the t power. <coughs> now, let me just take an example of how I would use that formula in a specific problem. Uh, suppose that we were to deposit, uh, let's say, uh, $1,000 in an account that pays 5% interest and this money is, this interest rate is compounded annually. That is, the interest is added into the account at the end of each year. That's not the way most banks would normally compound money, but suppose that were the case. And so we might ask the question, um, how much is in the account uh, at the end of five years? at the end of five years. Well, I can use the formula that I just derived to work this problem. The formula said P of T is, um, whoops, A of T is P times one plus R to the T power. So in this case, A at five would be a thousand, because that was the initial principle, times one plus 0 0.05, because that's the interest rate, to the fifth power, because we're talking about five years. So this is going to be 1,000 times 1.05. Maybe somebody can get out their calculator and be calculating this for us so I don't have to stop to do this. This will be 1,000 times 1 1.05 to the fifth power. Uh, Stephen, looks like maybe you have an answer for that. What did you get? Uh, $1,276. <coughs> And 28 cents. And 28 cents. Now, did, did you round up or round down when you said 28 cents? I round down. You rounded, rounded down. down. Okay. Now, you know what? At a bank, I don't believe they would ever round up because they would say, you haven't earned that 28 cent there. So it's really 27 point something cents. So I think they would round that down and they would call that a 27. So at, at a bank, that's always rounded down because technically you haven't earned that extra full penny. You'd have to ask your individual bank to see, but we're talking about small potatoes here, but uh, it looks like at the end of five years, you'd have $1,276.27 in that case. 
Okay, well now, from this formula, I want to look at some other formulas that go with it that um, will be useful when we compound num numbers. Suppose that rather than uh, adding the interest at the end of the year, suppose we divide up the year, like in the months, for example, and we add interest at the end of every month so that your interest gets in there a little bit earlier, and then the interest begins to draw interest. So that would be called compounding monthly. Uh, most uh, savings accounts that you would see at a savings and loan or at a bank are compounded daily. So actually, the interest is added at the end of the day. Um, and uh, that way, the sooner the interest gets in, the faster the money compounds, and so the more money you could actually earn. Now, the formula we just had said, whoops, I keep writing a P there, A of T, the amount at time T, is P times 1 plus R to the T power. Now, this was for uh, money that's being compounded annually. But suppose we have N compounding periods in a year. For example, what if the money is being compounded per month? There would be 12 compounding periods per year. Here's how we adjust the formula. The amount in the account now will be the initial principal times the interest rate per period. Well, if there were n periods in a year, you're, you're getting an interest rate of r over n per period. So for example, if it were 5% per year, how much would that be per month? It would be 5% over 12. But then on the other hand, the power changes because instead of having t years, now we want to look at how many compounding periods there are. And in t years, there would be n times t compounding periods. So for example, in t years, there would be 12 times t months. So uh, you divide by 12 or divide by n uh, inside, but you multiply by n in the exponent. Now this actually tends to give a slightly larger answer. Suppose that we were to take that same principle of $1,000. Stephen, maybe you could get your calculator out again for us here. And suppose we were going to uh, have our money compounded at 5% per year, 5% per year, but it's compounded, compounded monthly. And we're going to leave the money in the account for 5 years. I think you'll find this ends up being a little bit more than what it was before. The way I'll calculate the amount in the account after five years will be 1,000 times 1 plus 0 0.05 divided by 12, because this money is being compounded monthly. And then in five years, there are 12 times 5 months. There are that many compounding periods. So this gives me 1,000 times 1 plus 0 0.05 over 12 to the 60th power. And Stephen, how much do you get this time? $1,283, and since we're not always rounding down, 35 cents. And 35 cents. OK, so we're going to round down there. And before, I think we had 1,270 something dollars. Or was it 81? I've, I've forgotten. But it was slightly less than this. Not much. Not much. Now, wh how would we have done this differently if we had been compounding daily, which is actually what most banks do? How would I change this expression up here? You change the 12 to 365. Right. We'd put 365 there, which makes this interest rate per day even smaller than what it was uh, per month. But then what would we put up here? 365. 365 times 5. So now we have a bigger period, and you would find out that this ends up being slightly higher, like it might go to $1,284, $1,285. Wouldn't be much more, but slightly more. Now, let's go to, uh, to the uh, next graphic, and uh, we'll see two of these three formulas listed. <coughs> uh, there are three formulas for, comp for computing interest. Uh, compound first of all, the interest compounded annually, and our formula is A equals P times 1 plus R to the T power. Interest compounded N times per year, and A equals P times 1 plus R over N to the N T power. And now finally, here's a new formula for continuously compounded interest. Now, let's come back to the green screen and let me explain what that, what that means. Rather than being compounded uh, per month, per week, per day, even per hour, 
or even per minute, what if money was being continuously added to your account? It would be very small, but that's called continuous compounding. And then the formula changes, and the, and the formula becomes this. A equals P times E to the RT. Now this is where E is that same number, 2.718 approximately. We gave a longer decimal expansion for that. And you notice that the interest rate is now moved into the exponent. Now to explain how this happens, you really have to know a little bit about calculus. So what we're going to do is take this formula for granted and let's see how much would be $1,000 placed in an account that pays 5% interest annually, but it's compounded continuously. continuously, and we leave it for five years. Now, last time we had uh, $1,283.35. That's what we got. Let me just write that down, $1,283.35. That's what we saw when we were compounding it uh, daily. So this time, the amount of interest, or the amount in the account after five years, will be 1,000 times E to the 0 0.05, that's the interest rate, times 5, that's the value of t. And this is 1,000 times e to the 0 0.25 power. That's the 1 fourth power. And when you multiply that out, um, Stephen, what did you get? Uh, $1,284.02. And 2 cents. So by continuous compounding, we have increased this by a total of uh, 67 cents. Now you might say, well, Dennis, <clears throat> of all these compounding schemes, it sounds like continuous compounding is the, is the fastest growing scheme of all. But uh, most banks don't do this because, you see, if you had an account where money was compounded continuously, then you'd have to have a time clock so that if you went to close your account, they'd have to know at what time of day you actually closed it because every moment there's interest being added to the account. So what they do is they just run all the files at the end of the day and up, upgrade them with the, new, with the newly added interest at the end of the day. And you see it only makes a, what, 67 cents difference over a period of five years. So um, there's the, a the very, very slight increase in going to continuous compounding and it would be too much uh, too much bother I think for a bank to have to determine at what time you actually made a deposit or made a withdrawal. Um, <clears throat> let's go to the next graphic and we'll we'll see the results of three different schemes for some other numbers. Uh, I just computed these uh, before class and I'll show you the answers and you could check these out on your own. Uh, the example says verify the value of, 1, 000, of, of a $1,000 investment, that should be singular there, at 4% after three years. Now that's 4% annually, but the money may be compounded by these three different schemes. Uh, then it also says find the equivalent annual interest rate. Uh, I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. Now in Part A, if, you, if the money is compounded annually, uh, you get $1,124.86 and the equivalent annual interest rate is 4% because this is compounded annually. <clears throat> if the money were compounded monthly, you would get $1,127.27 and it says the, the equivalent annual interest rate is 4.074. Let me show you how that number was just derived. Uh, if, if we go back to uh, our original formula that says A equals P times 1 plus R to the T power. This was for an annual compounding. Now under this scheme where we were compounding monthly, our $1,000 grew to $1,127.27. But it started off at $1,000. Now, what would be the annually compounded interest rate that would have produced this amount after three years? So what I'm going to do is solve this equation for R, and that's the percentage interest rate that you saw on the screen. It's going to be slightly more than 4% because I'm, I'm acting now as if this were just annual uh, compounding. So I would divide by 1,000, and I would get 1.12727 equals 1 plus r to the third power. And then to solve for r, I take the cube root of both sides. So I take the cube root of 1.12727 1 
equals 1 plus r. And then if I solve for r, I would subtract 1 <coughs> from this answer. So on my calculator, I'd compute the cube root of 1.12727, and then I would subtract 1. Now, if you do that, you'll find out that r is approximately 0 0.04. 074 are 4.074%. Now what that means is, rather than having your money invested at 4% compounded monthly for three years, if you invested it annually, uh, excuse me, if you invested it in a scheme that compounded it annually, it would, the interest rate would have to go up to 4.074% in order for it to grow to that same amount. So this is the equivalent annual interest rate um, if it were compounded annually. Now let's go back to that graphic one more time. <clears throat> and uh, it says in part C that if you were compounding continuously, uh, the money would grow to uh, $1,127.49. That's what? Only a gain of uh, 22 cents after three years. What would be the equivalent annual interest rate if it were being compounded annually rather than continuously? And it would be slightly higher, 4.081%. Now, in order to get that figure, we have to know something about logarithms that will come up later on in this, in this episode, in the next episode. So we'll just have to take that number uh, as it's given and move on. Okay, let's go on to the next graphic and look at an example. <coughs> In this problem, it says, assume that the population of a city grows exponentially uh, at an annual rate of 2.4%. Now, by the way, when I say it grows exponentially, what I mean by that, that, that sort of a, a label, growing exponentially, means that, it's, that the population of a city grows continuously. That is, people are added to the population uh, at it could be any moment of the day. I mean, people aren't born at the end of the day or people aren't born at noon only. And the same way for people who die within the population or move away. People may move into the town at any given time or they move out of town theoretically at any given time. So we say it grows exponentially, meaning I'm gonna use my uh, natural exponential function to model this. So as a continuously compounded problem. And it says um, its population in the year 2003 is 286,000. Now, if this continues, predict its population in the year 2025. Okay, well, let's take that information and uh, put it up here. We're assuming the population grows exponentially. Now, what that means mathematically for us is that the population at time t and here I will call it P because it stands for population, equals the initial population, which I'll call P sub zero, that's the population in the year 2003, times E to the R T power. You see, this looks like a continuously compounded interest problem, except now we're talking about money growing, or we're talking about population growing rather than money in an account growing. So the initial population was 286,000. So I'm gonna substitute 286,000 right here for P sub zero times E to the, uh, let's see now, the interest rate or the, uh, the rate of growth was 2.4%. That'll be 0.024% um, times T because we haven't been given the T yet. Now the question was, if this is the population in the year 2003, what's the population in the year 2025 if this continues? Well, how many years lapses between those two times? 22, 22 years. So what I'm gonna do is calculate P at 22. <coughs> so if I calculate P after 22 years, that'll be 286,000 times E to the 0 0.024 times 22 power. Now, let me just show you how I would calculate that now on a calculator. Okay, now if we multiply that out, that's 286,000 uh, times uh, the exponential function. And I can find the exponential function. It's written right above this key that says LN on my calculator. So if I push second, then you'll see it's E raised to the power of, and I'll open parentheses, 
0.024 times 22, close parentheses, and I'll enter. And this looks like it's around 485,000. I don't think we should take it so literally that we should round it off to the nearest person. I'll say it's 285,000. So this is approximately, uh, whoops, 485,000 it should be. 485,000. And, you know, to be really more, uh, more reasonable about it, I think we should say it's about half a million is what it is. So it's about half a million people. So we have a town here with a population of 286,000 people, and it's growing at a rate of 2.4% per year. Uh, it's growing exponentially. And so at the end of 22 years, we'll have about half a million people in this, in this town. Okay, um, let me go to a, a graphic, uh, not, not to a graphic, but to a, uh, a newspaper article that was in the Salt Lake Tribune. And let me show you what this looks like, if you can, if you can read this. Can you uh, zoom down on this? I want to show in particular the graph that's over on the right-hand side. Now, this is a newspaper article, uh, article that was printed on Thursday, December 28th. The year was 2000. So this is a rather old uh, uh, cutout from the newspaper that I made. And you know, it gives the population of Utah back here in the year 1900. And the entire state had a population of about 277,000. Not too far off from what that example had in it initially that we just looked at. Uh, by the year 1910, the population was about 377,000. And now you notice that it just keeps climbing every year. There's a big jump between 1940 and 1950 from 552,000 to 696,000. Anybody have an explanation of why it would jump so much during the 1940s? Baby boomers, yeah. Right after World War II, there were probably a lot of children born right then. And you notice from that point on, this begins to rise rather dramatically. And if you look at this, shall we call this graph overall, it looks a little bit like an exponential function. The population is growing more or less exponentially. I don't think we should expect that an exponential function would calculate all of these numbers precisely, but it does look like the state has been growing exponentially, uh, more or less. And in the year 2000, the population of the state this was estimated at about 2,160,000. Now you see this was in a newspaper article from December 28th, the year was 2000, so they didn't have an accurate uh, estimate of the population at that, at that time. <coughs> okay, so it does look like populations may grow more or less exponentially. Okay, let's go to another example. This one also comes from the newspaper. And this was in the sports section of the Salt Lake Tribune just this spring. Now, I'm talking to you in the spring of 2003, and this is during spring training, and this is an article about the New York Yankees. Uh, you know, the title of the article says, The Yanks Reach Another Milestone, this time for salary. Let me just read a little bit to you, and there's a mathematics problem here about uh, continuously compounded interest. Now, the article says, even before the start of the season, the New York Yankees were smashing barriers. New York set a record with $138 million payroll last year, that would have been 2002, according to final tabulation by the commissioner's office, and is on the verge of becoming the first team to top $150 million. Now, it says the Yankees' 2003 payroll stands at $149.2 million, that's this year, for 22 signed players likely to be on the opening day roster, plus an injured pitcher, John, John Lieber, uh, according to contract. Uh, okay, well, let's put some of this information down on the green screen, and let's predict what their team salary will be next year. It says in the year 2002, the team salary was $138 million. And this year, in 2003, now the season hasn't actually started yet, the team salary is 149.5, uh, no, 0.2 it was, million dollars. Now, let's assume exponential growth in the team salaries. And the question is, what will be the team salary next year in 2004 for the New York Yankees? So we want to make a prediction on this. Well, I'm going to take 2002 as my base year. I'm going to call that T equals zero. 
2003, I'll call that t equals 1, one year later. In 2004, I'll call that t equals 2. Now, if salaries are growing exponentially, that would say that the salary at time t should be s sub 0, that would be the starting salary in the year, in the year 0, times e to the r t power. Trouble is, we don't know what r is. <clears throat> so I'm going to say that s at t is equal to s at 0. Now, in the year 0, that was 138 million. I'll just put 138 there. We'll have to remember this is in millions, times e to the r t power. And I'm wanting to calculate the team salary in the year uh, t equals 2. So s at 2 equals. Well, what I do know is that s at 1 is equal to 149.2 million dollars. And that would be 138 times e to the r times 1 power. I'm putting in a 1 for t there. And so e to the r is 149.2 over 138. That's what e to the r is. So what is s at 2? Let's see, I think maybe I can squeeze this in right here. What is s at 2? That, that is an s there. Well, that will be 138 times e to the r times 2 power, which is 138 times e to the r squared. You notice I'm using properties of exponents here. I'm putting r on the inside and the 2 on the outside, and if I raise e to the r and square it, then that's e to the 2r power. And I just found out that e to the r is this ratio. So this is 138 <coughs> times 149.2 over 138 squared. Now, what I'll need to do is to calculate that on my calculator. Stephen, you have your calculator out already. Have you calculated that by any chance? I'm getting that. Okay, and I'll be calculating here. Those of you at home, try calculating it, and I'll work it over here on the side. Um, and I get 161.3, approximately. 161.3. Is that what you got, Stephen? That's what I have. Okay. So, of course, this is measured in millions. So, the New York Yankees have not topped a $150 million team salary, but they're right on the verge of it, and we would predict that next year, if things continue to grow exponentially, it'll be 161.3. Now, of course, in the real world, there are a number of factors that affect salaries and what the team salary will be. You know, there may be a major player who retires, an expensive player who retires or is traded, or it may be that they, that they pick up a player with a really big contract. And so this figure could be a little bit higher or lower, but this is our prediction based on the evidence that we have here. <clears throat> okay, um, so much for exponential functions and compound interest. Let's move now to another topic. And this is a, this is a, uh, a uh, completely different topic. It's an introduction to logarithms. Uh, let me begin on the green screen <coughs> and tell you that if you write an expression such as uh, 5 squared equals 25, I would say this is written in what I'll call exponential form. That's because I'm using an exponent, namely the 2, and I put the exponent up in the air. We're all accustomed to this, and so 5 squared is 25. Now, there is another form of writing this called logarithmic form, and what you do is you write log base 5. That's the base that was over here. So now I write that as a subscript, and I put a 25 after it. The log base 5 of 25 equals 2. Now, this is referred to as logarithmic form. And it turns out that in this notation, some problems are much easier to solve. This idea was invented by a guy named um, Napier, or not Napier, a Scotsman uh, in the 17th century. And you see what's happened is what used to be the exponent is now written on the ground over here on the right-hand side. The logarithm is equal to the exponent. The number that was the old base becomes a subscript. And the number which used to be the exponential value, 25, is now written inside the logarithm. So we read this as the log base 5 of 25 equals 2. 
let me just write one more like this. Suppose I were to say um, uh, 2 to the fifth power is 32. I'm using the same numbers, but I've reversed their positions. 2 to the fifth power is 32. This is written in exponential form. How would I write that in logarithmic form? Well, I write the log base. Now, the base is whatever the base was over here, base 2, but I write that as a subscript. And the exponent is going to be put over here on the right-hand side. The logarithm always equals the exponent. So the 32 has to go in here. <coughs> now, what if I reverse this process? This time, I'm going to write something in logarithmic form. I want you to tell me what is its exponential equivalent. Suppose we say the log base 4 of 1 fourth is negative 1. How would I write that in exponential form? 4 to the negative 1 power. 4 to the negative 1 power is equal to 1 fourth. Is 1 fourth, and that's, that's true. 4 to the negative 1 power is 1 fourth. Uh, you notice that whatever is the subscript, I call that the base, log base 4, that becomes the base of the exponential. And the negative 1, the logarithm equals the negative 1, that becomes the exponent. So 4 to the negative 1 power equals the quantity inside 1 fourth. So the number inside here couldn't be anything other than 1 fourth, or this would not have been true. Let's go to the next graphic, and we'll see some other examples of this uh, expressed on the screen. On the left-hand side, we have the exponential form uh, of an expression, 4 to the third power, 64. And on the right-hand side, we have the logarithmic equivalent of that, the log base 4 of 64 equals 3. And then, as a second example, we have 2 to the negative 1 is a half. And on the right-hand side, the logarithmic equivalent of that says log base 2 of 1 half equals the exponent. And so the exponent is negative 1. Now, uh, right below this is a very important statement that, you, that we will refer to frequently during this, during this uh, material for this next exam. You want to remember that a logarithm is an exponent. You see, the logarithms on the right-hand side always equal to the exponent. They equal to 3. The second one equals negative 1. So the logarithm is an exponent because it's equal to the exponent. So whatever in doubt what the logarithmic value is, you set it equal to the, to the exponent. Okay, in this next example, it asks us to do this, the same thing again with a few more problems. Write the following exponential expressions in logarithmic form. And this gives us some practice in recognizing this notation and, and knowing where the individual pieces go. Let me, let me write those three problems down right here on my green board. And then I'm going to ask people here in the classroom how to write each of these in logarithmic form. Part A was that 5 cubed is 125. Part B is that 0.2 to the 0 power is 1, and the last one is 9 to the negative 1 half power is 1 third. Now, first of all, would you agree with all three of these statements? 5 cubed is 125? Yeah. I think so. 5 times 5 times 5 is a 125. Um, any non-zero number to the 0 power is 1, so 0.2 to the 0 power is 1, and 9 to the negative 1 half. Well, now, see, what does the 1 half power mean? The square root of... Uh, 1 over the square root of? Yeah, exactly. So the 1 half means take the square root, and the negative means flip it over. So we're supposed to take the square root of 9 and then invert it. So the square root of 9 is 3, and we invert it and get a third. Well, um, let's see. Matt, what is the logarithmic equivalent of 5 to the third power is 125? Uh, log base 5 of 125 equals 3. Log base 5 of 125 equals 3. That's exactly right. Now, these two things mean the same thing. Um, Sam, what would be the equivalent of 0 0.2 to the 0 power is 1? It'd be log base 0.2 to the 1 equals 0. Okay, I would say log base 0.2 of 1 okay. equals 0. So if you take this base, raise it to that power, then you'll get 1. And in the last case, Susan, what would you say is the logarithmic statement for C? Log base 9 yeah, of log, one third. Log base 9 of 1 third, I'll put parentheses around that, equals? Negative 1 half. Equals negative 1 half. That's, that's exactly right. Okay, uh, we have another example after this that's a little bit different. <coughs> so let's go to the next graphic. Okay, uh, this time the question is to find the value of the variable 
in each one of the following logarithmic uh, expressions. Let me write each one of these on the screen here for the, for the class to see as well as the people at home. Uh, log base 4 of x equals 2. The question is what is x? Uh, and then in the next one it says the log base 0 0.01 of 100 equals y. So the question is what is y? And in part C, we have the log base B of 6 equals 1 half. Th this is a B. looks sort of like a 6, doesn't it? So let me, let me try to emphasize that's the letter B. Okay, coming back to the classroom. <clears throat> to figure out what X is here, what I would do is I would convert this to exponential form because you and I are much more comfortable with exponential form because we've just introduced the logarithmic notation. Can anyone tell me what this says in exponential form? 4 squared equals x. Exactly. You see, here's the base, 4. Uh, the logarithm is equal to the exponent, so 2 is the exponent. And that has to equal the third number, x. So x is 4 squared, so what that tells me is that x is equal to 16. Yeah, that's the answer to this logarithmic expression. Or actually, equation. It's a logarithmic equation. Okay, in the next case, um, let's see. Matt, can you tell me what is the... Um, what is the exponential equivalent of this? Uh, 0 0.01 yep. raised to the y equals 100. Equals 100, right. Now let's just go over that. You remember y is the exponent because the logarithm equals the exponent. So the y goes in the air. This is the base, so 0 0.01 is the base. And this is equal to 100. Now this may look rather complicated. Can anyone think of a, way to, a simpler way to write this so we can solve for y? 1 over 100 to the y power equals 100. Right. Point zero 0.01 means 1 over 100 to the y power equals 100. Okay. Now, what do you do to 1 over 100 to get 100? Well, you have to flip it over. And to flip it over, what should the exponent be? Negative, negative 1. So y is going to be negative 1. Yeah. You know, uh, just in case you didn't think of that, let me show you another route you could have, go to, you could have gone, taken to solve this. Uh, we could have written the inside as 100 to the negative 1 power. Yeah, because 1 over 100 means 100 to the negative 1 power. Now, if I multiply exponents together, this says 100 to the negative y power equals 100. And by the way, this is 100 to the first power. And therefore, these exponents should be alike. So negative y should be 1, and therefore y is negative 1. Now, this is a little bit longer tack to get to the answer, but if you find this more comfortable or more agreeable to you, you're welcome to follow that approach. What we did back here, the shorter way, was to just say what we need to do is invert the 1 over 100 to get 100. So the exponent that'll do that is the exponent negative 1, and y was a negative 1. Okay, so either way you look at it, this answer is uh, y equals negative 1. Okay, now we have a third problem here. Uh, log base b of 6 is a half. Um, Stephen, how would you write this exponentially? <coughs> uh, b to the 1 half power equals 6. b to the 1 half power equals 6. Exactly, because this is the base, b. We always take that subscript to be the base. This is the exponent over here, so it's b to the 1 half power. And the number inside is the value of the exponential expression. So this says the square root of b is 6, and therefore b must be what? 36. Must be 36. Yeah, must be 36. So b equals 36 is the answer. Uh, by the way, the, the base that I put here for the logarithm, obviously it doesn't have to be an integer because we have a case here where I used a decimal, but the base always has to be a positive number. Um, so that's the only restriction that we place on that, on that logarithm. Okay, now you can find some logarithmic values on your calculator, and let's go to the next graphic to describe the two that are available on your calculator. Uh, the, the, the two logarithms available on your calculator are called common logarithms and natural logarithms. Now, the logarithm log base 10 of a number, say x, this sort of a logarithm is called a common logarithm, and it's actually the older of the two logarithms that we're going to discuss here. Log base 10, or common logarithms, go back for several hundred years. And uh, because they're so, quote, common, this is normally abbreviated as just log x. 
So if you don't see a subscript on the log, then that's normally taken to be log base 10. So in that first sentence, it says the logarithm, log base 10 of x, is a common logarithm and is abbreviated as log x with, with no subscript at all. <clears throat> now, the other logarithm that's, that's rather common is the log base e. You remember e is the number 2.718 approximately. And the logarithm log base e of x is called a natural logarithm and it's abbreviated as ln of x for natural logarithm. Uh, now you may say, Dennis, I don't see anything natural at all about the number e, but if you recall, when we had the function e to the x, we call that the natural exponential function, and now in this case, log base e, we call the natural logarithmic function, and they both have abbreviated names, um, and uh, uh, this one has an abbreviated name because it's used so often. Now if you look on your calculator, the last sentence here says your calculator has only two keys designated for logarithms and you'll have a key that says LOG and a key that says LN. Um, now let me just show you on this um, on this graphing calculator, we'll come back to the green screen. Um, if you can zoom in close enough over in the left hand column I have two keys. One of them says LOG, one of them says LN. And let me just show you how these work. Suppose I want to take uh, the log of 100. And I think if I put it over here on the side, I can write just beside it. The log of 100. Now, th what this means is log base 10. But if there's no base shown there, we just assume it to 10, even if it's not expressed there. Now, if I were to put a 10 here, what exponent would you put on 10 to get 100? 2. 2, right. So that answer is 2. So the log of 100 should be 2. Let's try this on the calculator and see what happens. I'm going to press the log button, and I'm going to enter 100, and then push Enter, and we get a 2 over here on the right-hand side. Okay, let's take another example. What if I were to take the log of 0 0.1. Now, let's see, to, to figure out what this answer would be, remember, this means base 10. What exponent would I put on base 10 to get 1 tenth for the answer? Negative, Negative 1, yeah. You see, if you think of this as a fraction, this is the fraction 1 over 10. 10 to the negative 1 power is 1 tenth, or 0.1. Let's try that here on the calculator, and I'm going to take the log of 0 0.1, and when I enter it, I get negative 1. Yep, that's exactly right. Okay, now the other key on this calculator I want you to notice is the natural log key. Now what if I take uh, ln, ln of, um, of 1? I'm wondering what that would be. Well, let's see. Now you know there's actually a base here. The base is E. 2.718 approximately. What exponent would I put on base E to get 1 for the answer? Zero. Zero. Yeah, I think that'd be zero. Does everybody agree with that? Because mm -hmm. see, what we're thinking is an exponential form, E to the zero power is equal to 1. That's what I'm thinking. Now, of course, the E isn't shown, but when you see LN, it's assumed to be base E. Let's try computing this. I'm going to push the natural log button. The natural log of 1 natural log of 1 equals, so if I push enter, and I get a 0 right over there. And let's take one more. <clears throat> okay, this one's kind of tricky. What would be ln of the quantity e to the third power? Does anyone have a guess as to what that answer would be? 3? That would be 3. Okay, Stephen, tell us how you came up with that answer. Um, well, you want to find out what, what power you raise e to to get uh -huh. e to the third, and, uh -huh. well, you're kind of given the answer there. Exactly. So the get, question is, uh, I'm sorry, what were you going to say? Well, to get um, 
e to the third from e you simply raise it to the third power exactly. so the answer is right. three so we have the answer right there in front of us so the question is going back to the green screen if we were to take this base e which generally of course is not shown if you were to take that base e and raise it to some power to get e cube what would the power be well the power should be three now i'm going to try that here on the on the green screen and i'm actually going to substitute in the approximate value of e, so I should get an approximate value for 3. So I'm going to take the natural log of the quantity uh, e. Now, see, how much was e again? Who can tell us? 2.718. Uh, 2.718. Okay, approximately. That's the number we've been using. And I'm going to raise that to the third power. So I have 2.718 raised to the third power, close parentheses. Now, do you think I'm going to get an answer of exactly 3? No, because this isn't exactly E. Is this number a little bit too big or a little bit too small for E? A little bit too small. A little bit too small. So anyone want to take a wild guess as to what answer we're actually going to see on the screen when I press enter? 2.97. Uh, 2.97, okay. So Sam's going out of limb. He says 2.97. Anybody want to go for 2.98? 2.99. Okay, Matt says 2.99, but I noticed he kind of glanced down at his calculator. So, uh, <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll see if he's already worked this. Let's see. Uh, 2.999688, etc. Okay, now, okay, let's do this one more time. Natural log of the quantity. I'm going to put in a more accurate decimal expansion of E. 2.718. Now, if you remember, then it was 2.81828, and then 459045. You might say, Dennis, are we really supposed to remember all that? No, not at all. But at the beginning of this episode, I told you more digits in that number. I'm going to raise that to the third power, close parentheses, and now I should get, I hope, 2.9999. I'm going to get a bunch of nines. I still won't get three because I think that number is a little bit still too small. So I press Enter. And I got three. Why do you think it said exactly three? Calculator rounded. The calculator rounded off. You see, this, this only goes out so far, and it rounds off the last digit. So it rounded it off to three. So uh, that, is our, that is our best estimate for that number. OK, let's go to the next graphic and uh, look at this example. It says, evaluate the following logarithms. Well, I'm going to do this, first of all, without a calculator. And then I want to show you one more graphic before we leave about using your calculator. Um, okay, without a calculator, I'm wondering if someone can tell me, I'm going to write this on the screen here, what is the log of 100,000? And while we're at it, let me write down the other problems. What is the natural log of E cubed? Oh my goodness, I'll, I just happened to make up the same problem I had on, the, on my graphic. So I think you'll you know what that one is. And for part C, what is the log base 12 of 1 over 144? That's kind of a ringer. It's not a natural log or a common log. <clears throat> okay, coming back to the green screen, in part A, when I say the log of 100,000, what base are we assuming here? Base 10. Okay, so 10 to some power is 100,000. Does anyone know what power that would be? Five. It'd be the fifth power. Yeah. What's a, what's a quick way you can tell the power on 10 that will give you 100,000? Just count the zeros. Yeah, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's 10 to the fifth. So, for example, if this had been 100, just 100, 100 has two zeros, so 10 to the second power is 100. So that answer is 5. Uh, this problem is way too familiar for us because I just happened to make it up again for the second time. This answer is how much? Be three. It, it could be three. It could be if you were lucky. This is your lucky day. And uh, okay, now in the last case, log base 12 of 1 over 144. Um, let's see. Susan, do you want to take a guess at that one? Negative two. Negative two is exactly right. You are a winner. Okay, negative two. Now, which one of these would I have not been able to have computed on my calculator? <clears throat> C, because we don't have a button that says log base 12. We have a log base 10, we have a natural log. Now you might say, well, gee, what's wrong with these cheap calculators? They don't even give us a log base 12 button. What are we supposed to do if we encounter a log base 12 and uh, we don't know the answer otherwise? Well, we will find a way in the next episode to convert any logarithm base 
to base 10 or base E. So we can actually use these two buttons to work a base 12 problem, but we haven't seen how to do this yet. Okay, now, in the last minute or so, let's go to the last graphic. We have one more graphic here, and it's titled Logarithms and Calculators. I wanted to give you an example of two different calculators and the order of the buttons that you have to push in order to do these. First of all, I'm going to use my graphing calculator once again. And uh, if you'll come back to the green screen, <coughs> uh, the question was to find the log of 481. Now, on, on this TI-82 and other TI calculators similar to it, if you want to take the log of 481, what you do is you enter it in that order. You push the log button and then 481. And the answer is 2.6821. And back on that graphic, you would have seen that was, this is the answer I'd written out. I would have guessed there was going to be a 2 in front because this number is more than 100. 481 is more than 100, and the log of 100 is 2. So this would be a little bit more than 2, 2.68. Now, if I go to a different TI calculator, just happens this is another TI calculator. This is a little TI-30 that I brought from home. And on this calculator, I have a log button and a natural log button written not in the left-hand column, but on the third row. And if I want to take the log of 481 on this calculator, I enter 481, and after I push the logarithm, and I get 2.6821, etc. Now, you notice there was a slight pause before that number came up. Let me go back and do that again. I'm going to enter 481, and when I push the log button, there's a slight pause before the number appears. There you go. It was only a fraction of a second, but that's because the calculator has in it a little subprogram where it's actually making some arithmetic computations to come up with that number. It doesn't have this answer memorized. It actually has to compute it. And that little pause is telling you it's sort of like thinking just for a moment, you might say, thinking in quotes, before it can give you that answer. Now, on the other hand, if I say 2 times 2, look how fast the answer comes up. 2 times 2 equals, bingo, 4 because there's only one calculation there, 2 times 2 is 4, but for the logarithm value, there was a slight pause because there's more going on than meets the eye, and you'll hear about that in a calculus class. I'll see you next time for episode um, 18, where we will continue talking about logarithms. Uh, see you then. <laughs>